before I start talking, I wanted to say a couple of things. The first is I probably have the most diverse nutrition practice of uh, many of the people in this room, even though everybody else does really good work. I, I left a really good fellowship, but I didn't do a nutrition fellowship, so I sort of entered nutrition through the back door. And my basic interest is in nutrition in the ICU. So I round with the NICU, the PICU, the surgeons, beat my head against the wall several times. But, but it's, it's really enjoyable. And I think, I think you should, you, uh, those of you that are still young enough and looking for careers, you should consider nutrition. Uh, and another reason is if you double the number of nutrition experts in this room, that's about as many nutrition people as there are in the US. So we are looking for more people to join our cause. And the reason I'm talking about failure to thrive was when I, joined, when I went to Milwaukee and started my clinic there, I wanted to set up a short bowel clinic, which was pretty much the only thing that I knew how to take care of. And short bowel, uh, short bowel syndrome program takes a while to build up. So they started filling it up with FTT patients, and I have a thriving FTT population. Thriving, uh, you know, you can use it whichever way you like. So uh, I'm going to talk about failure to thrive. Um, these are my objectives. I think FTT is a, is a lousy term, and I think we all agree with that. It, it is probably more likely and more accurately described in developing countries as uh, protein energy malnutrition. But we should not see it as a disease. We should look at it as a symptom representing uh, multiple uh, pathways. The problem with FTT is if you look at the book, or if more accurately look at the literature, there are tons of definitions. And some of these are right for a particular patient, but oftentimes uh, all of these definitions can be wrong for a specific patient, and that's what makes it really difficult. The first thing that I was taught a long time ago was that if you were below the third percentile, then you had, you had FTT. The first question is, is 3% of the population really below the third percentile? And if you look at the way the WHO growth charts were constructed, they actually took out the lowest and the highest standard deviation. So they took out the thinnest and the fattest kids already. So if you see somebody below the second percentile on a WHO growth chart or uh, the third percentile on a CDC growth chart, that is abnormal. Okay? Um, the, the next question is, is weight alone enough? Uh, proportionately, small children are often not failing to thrive. Uh, and so therefore, weight for length or body mass index less than the third percentile may be a better marker of failure to thrive. There's one caveat to this is that if you have been failing to thrive or malnourished for a long period of time, your height will drop. And at that point, your weight for length or BMI will sort of creep back up. So you have to keep that in mind when you when you uh, take care of kids like this. This is the age-old uh, water low classification, and uh, this uses a variety of things. And I'm going to try and convince you that we should all go to Z-scores. We should give up everything else and go to Z-scores. This is what I've been proposing in my hospital, and we're moving to EPIC, but EPIC in its, uh, in its uh, EPIC majesty will not allow us to do Z-scores. So I will have to use some other funky program on the side so that I can keep Z-scores in. They tell me that sometime in 2013, I will be able to do Z-scores. It is, it is quite difficult to do Z-scores with paper and pencil because the, uh, the equations are quite hard. So if you do have a computerized medical program that will allow you to do Z-scores, forget about everything else and go to Z-scores. And this is, this is a clear example of why that should be done. I've seen that the top dot being represented as three small squares below the third percentile, and this one being eight small squares, and so on. So all of that really doesn't make sense. Two centimeters below the third percentile, who cares? Um, I, think, I, think, I think a z-score of negative 3.5 says exactly that. And that's why, that's why it's important to go to z-scores. The other important thing is you can compare child A with child B if you're interested in research. You can't do that with all of your other, other measurements. 
The other definition that uh, we were all taught is if you cross two major percentiles, then you have failure to thrive. And uh, if you look at at least a couple of, couple of studies, they've shown that 30% of full-term infants cross one percentile and 23% cross two percentiles between birth and age two years. And study actually correlated weight at, uh, at the age of one year with weight between four and eight weeks rather than at birth. So remember that just crossing percentiles by itself does not mean that you are failing to thrive. And the other, the other thing to remember is that growth charts are actually fudged to make them look nice and smooth so that we can deal with it. If we had growth charts that went zigzag, we wouldn't be able to use them. So that's, that's another reason to remember that, that these growth charts are fudged, and if they cross centiles, you have to watch them, but they may not be uh, problems. I think uh, Maria alluded to some of this uh, earlier today. And uh, bottom line is use the World Health Organization growth charts for kids up to the age of two, regardless of the ty type of feeding. We have undiagnosed failure to thrive in about 20 to 30% of our population since over the last year, simply because they come in with the CDC growth charts. We replot them on the CDC growth chart, print it out, uh, on the WHO growth chart, print it out, give it to them, and tell them that they are okay. So that's what you need to do. Two years, old, uh, two years and older, use the CDC, the charts that we've been using. Understand that fewer children will be identified as underweight using the WHO charts. And slower growth among breastfed infants during the ages three to 18 months is uh, absolutely normal. What is the prevalence? And this is a Danish cohort. The, the Scandinavians are good at getting population-based data. Based on a variety of factors, they figured out that 3% of their population was undernourished under the age of one year. And when you go back to those old seven criteria that I showed you, there was very poor concurrence among the seven criteria. None of the children met all seven criteria, and most only met one. More important, if you took one single criterion, it identified either less than half of the population or included too large a proportion of the cohort. So none of these definitions by themselves are useful. There are some normal variants masquerading as failure to thrive. And the first, the first is uh, genetic short stature. So you come from short parents, and uh, like uh, Dr. Scheiman was telling us, she was probably always short, but that's normal for her. And she probably had low percentiles all along. I'm only using her because she, she used herself as an example. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, she probably had low percentiles but did not cross percentiles. And uh, a mid-parental height of some sort has to be included in your evaluation of every child that's failing to thrive. And this is a slight fudge on the Tanner and White House method because parents come and tell me I'm 5'1 and 5'3. So I don't bother converting them to centimeters, so I have my own fudge. But then I use 8.5 centimeters to give me the fifth to the 95th percentile because I plotted on the growth chart and I know how many centimeters I can go down. So that's why, that's why I use this method. A little craziness. I think we discussed this somewhat. Uh, the X premature infant, uh, normal birth weight if corrected for gestation, low p uh, percentiles if corrected, they may then later show catch-up growth. We always talk about catch-up growth, but we also need to talk about catch-down growth. And this is a real entity, and it happens. Uh, so especially if you have a small mom who gives birth to a child who's on the 90th percentile, that child at some point has to reach his or her genetics. And that's what, that's what catch-down growth is all about initial fall in percentiles, and then, then they follow their own percentiles. S small for gestational age is something that you will see in a lot of your kids that are referred to you for failure to thrive. What I do is, as soon as I see a kid, I always plot them now on the new Olson growth charts, which, which came out from CHOP. They are available online or from, or from the JPEDS article or pediatrics article that it came out on. And if they're below the 10th percentile for gestational age, then I note down that they are small for gestational age. Again, the definition of small for gestational age is not completely accepted, but most people will say the 10th percentile is reasonable. 90% of these infants will catch up. 
the other 10% will show up in your clinic. So you need to be aware of that. And since Goldilocks has been brought up before, uh, kids with small for gestational age who don't gain enough weight or who gain too much weight do poorly. As one can expect, the ones that don't catch up don't grow as tall, they have poorer cognitive outcomes. On the other hand, if they, if they gain more than five kilograms in the first 16 weeks of life, they actually have less cognitive, uh, uh, not as good cognitive outcomes and have a higher BMI at the age of seven years. So somebody was asking me, how do I deal with small, uh, small for gestational age infants that land up in my clinic? As long as their nutritional intake is reasonable, I just tell parents that they are probably not going to grow as well as their peers. There are some data that small for gestational age infants who haven't caught up may benefit from growth hormone, but since we as a group don't really administer growth hormone, I suggest that as an option to parents if they are interested. So this is my own practical definition for FTT, and you can uh, punch holes in it all over the place, but this is the best that I can do. Uh, weight for length or a BMI Z-score less than uh, negative 2.0. Again, uh, excluding the kid who has been growing poorly for a long period of time and whose height has dropped. Otherwise, poor or no weight gain over a period of time that varies according to the age of the child. In general, the younger the child, the shorter, of the, uh, shorter the interval in which there is little or no weight gain. Uh, a significant downtrend in percentiles, but all of this needs to be thrown into the same box before you pull out the right answer. Uh, you look at assessment of parental size and growth, and you also correct for prematurity when, uh, when applicable. The issue is if you, if you take 100 of these kids, less than five, five of them will have organic disease. And does failure to thrive mean neglect? Uh, there have been at least two or three studies which have looked at this. Only five to 10% of failure to thrive infants are followed by child protective services or your state's equivalent of the same. I think all of us have a very uh, simple approach to FTT. The predominant reason is an inadequate intake of calories. The, the second is a loss of calories, which is vomiting, maldigestion, malabsorption. The third is increased caloric need, where they have cardiorespiratory disease, liver disease, renal disease, or chronic inf infections. And the final kids are the kids like with Down syndrome or something else, chromosomal, endocrine, and metabolic disorders. The vast proportion of your patients will be in the first category. And the other thing I've noticed is when we see FTT kids who are vomiting or diarrhea, we don't consider them as FTT. We try and take care of their vomiting and diarrhea, and then they grow. I will not go into this in, uh, in great detail, but basically, the problems underlying that a kid not getting enough food may vary from lack of available food all the way to maternal depression to specific organic issues in the infant. So what is my approach? My approach is you, you, have, to, you have to get to know everything from pregnancy and labor onwards. And this is where the IUGR and the SGA usually shows up, and that gives you a really good feel for what's going on. Early, early neonatal history as well as feeding issues in the first year of life, you will see a lot of children with FTT that have feeding problems. And if you see them early on, apart from getting a speech and language pathologist involved early, you are going to suspect that they're going to end up needing, uh, they're going to end up having neurological problems in the future because babies only cry, eat, uh, pee, and poop. And if one of those doesn't go very well, it, it may have something to do with their neurological system. Um, the, the one thing that I absolutely insist on is any child that comes to, to me with FTT, I need a growth chart. And I will call Badger, the pediatrician, to, to get, uh, get, get a fax of the growth charts to see where this kid has been doing or what this kid has been doing. Because otherwise, it's really, really hard to comment on what's going on. Um, the, the, my best story with that is I got a fax back which said, we do not do growth charts. <laughs> so, uh, and that was tough. But other than that, I've been pretty lucky. You usually do get a growth chart. 
feeding behavior and environment, I can't tell you how important it is. I will, uh, the, the classic example, I don't know how many of you see Indian children like, like my kind of Indian children. Uh, they have the worst behavioral problems, absolutely the worst. If you see them and if there's a grandma in the room, you're done. You might as well just turn around and, and walk back to your office and forget it. That kid's not going to get better. They will force feed, they will use every possible distraction, and they will not listen to you. So it is a problem. Okay. Uh, we typically use a 24-hour food recall. Uh, it is the rare patient that we use a three-day diet record. Uh, uh, but a 24-hour food recall usually works pretty well. Uh, this is, uh, this is more, more of the social history. One of the things I found is perception of growth failure as a problem. If the parents don't see it as a problem, they're not going to do what you tell them. So what I tell them is if you feed your child appropriately and the child grows, the child may end up winning the Nobel Prize, and we don't want your child to stop with a PhD. That, that really doesn't bother very many patients uh, because any other way of saying it and people might get offended. Uh, I, I heard a dad who told me, I didn't leave high school and I'll be happy if my kid uh, you know, just goes to high school. And that's what he told me. So it, sometimes you can't win with anything. <laughs> Physical exam, I think we've been through this, so I'm not going to go through this. I, I will just tell you that all of you should learn to do anthropometric measurements yourselves because as third year fellows, as you go into a new environment to practice, you need to be the one that teaches your medical assistants or whomsoever else to uh, measure kids appropriately. And if they're not being appropriately, you might as well throw all your nutritional stuff out the window because that's, that's, the, that's our bread and butter everyday stuff. You will see short stature kids that show up in your clinic, sort of just like how the endocrine uh, clinic sees failure to thrive just because the pediatrician doesn't know where to send them. Remember that most short stature is either familial or constitutional, and that from our perspective, children with growth hormone deficiency are usually not malnourished. And uh, we will also see kids who have an IGF level and they are sent to you, but kids with malnutrition will typically have a low IGF one, and that really doesn't help us very much. Most children with FTT do not need laboratory evaluations. Uh, the exceptions are when there's very significant FTT and FTT not due to caloric intake. These are some of the laboratory tests that uh, most people will consider, the usuals, which is a CBC and an ESR, a metabolic panel including electrolytes, looking for celiac disease, a fecal elastase, as well as a urine analysis. The one thing that I did not include here is what are the deficiencies that may be associated with failure to thrive? I always think of three deficiencies in a, in a kid that's eating normal food. I'm not talking about the kid with liver failure, short bowel, or bariatric surgery. I think of vitamin D because I think everybody in Wisconsin is vitamin D deficient. Iron deficiency is the most common deficiency in the entire world. And when it's not either of the two, it's zinc. So these are three things that you absolutely have to think of. If the kid is eating weird stuff and not getting enough fat, the fourth thing is essential fatty acid deficiency. Many of the other deficiencies, unless it's the autistic kid that's eating only two foods, are pretty unusual in free living children. So the, these are the things I think about. Do I often do these labs? I never do serum zinc on FTT kids because I know I'm going to give them zinc and the serum zinc lab is not great. Uh, I, uh, iron, it's only if I, have, if I have serious doubts about how much iron they're consuming. Vitamin D, I like to put all of them on vitamin D. So that's the way I approach that. Uh, I, think, I think you have to get parents to describe a typical day. You look for these three things, which is excessive juice intake, excessive milk intake, and grazing. Grazing is eating pretty much all of the time. As we all know, this is just ammunition for your parents. Juice is 15 calories per ounce, no protein. It is a contributing factor, surprisingly, both to FTT as well as obesity. And uh, we need to promote appropriate milk intake. Even though the AAP says you can drink this much juice, in, in an FTT clinic, my answer is Zippo. So no juice for the kids, because I know zero gradually gets converted into some other equivalent. 
I don't have uh, stock in any of these companies. I just put them out because we know them. Pediasure is the one that is commonly thought of as a 30 calorie per ounce beverage. Uh, slightly cheaper than that is Carnation Instant Breakfast with whole milk because you buy the packets and make it with your whole milk. The other way to make a 30 calorie per ounce beverage is whole milk with heavy whipping cream. The, the advantage of the last one, apart from being cheap, is you're not putting sugar in the beverage. And when the kid is no longer FTT, you can gradually move them down to whole milk and also down to 2% you know, milk or whatever they need, need to be on. This is really important, which uh, Indian parents find really hard to do. Meals and snacks at the table or in a high chair, structured meals and snacks, no, no more than 20 to 30 minutes to eat or drink, feed every three hours, only water between meals and snacks. Uh, what I tell them is give the milk with the meal, and if the kid is the kind that will guzzle down the milk and won't eat, give the milk towards the end of the meal. Um, and no force feeding no TV, none of that stuff, as much as the child will eat. This is, of course, assuming normal development. Um, there, there is no data on uh, any multivitamin, multimineral supplementation in FTT. Specifically, some of this data has been borrowed from other forms of malnutrition. Supplementation with zinc improves gains in weight and height. Uh, and these are the kids that are at risk for inadequate zinc intake, mostly breastfed infant, a picky eater on cow's milk. What I do instead of giving them zinc is I end up giving them a complete multivitamin. Uh, I don't have data suggesting that that's what we should do, but that's what most of us do. Uh, use a complete crushed multivitamin because that has zinc. A, a lot, of, lot of the gummy multivitamins don't have uh, selenium and they definitely don't have iron. So even uh, we've seen some gummies that are calling themselves complete, but the word complete is not regulated by the FDA. So you can, you can put whatever you want and call it complete. Okay. I think the main thing you need to do is you need to ensure that the kid is failing to thrive. And uh, then work out the basic reason for FTT. It is usually inadequate calories, but you need to uh, get into all of the other things that I spoke about. I think we discussed all of these things. Um, once you've done all of the basic things, you need to increase the calorie content of formula, and you need to increase caloric values of foods. There are two things I will tell you. One is try and use the foods that the family themselves eat. You will, if you don't tell them this, they will rapidly become you know, McDonald's junkies. We do not want kids to be eating chicken nuggets and french fries. So what I tell them is, Pick out your meal. Just before you put it in front of the child, add the fat that is appropriate to that uh, food. You know, you don't, want to put, you don't want to put olive oil on top of strawberries, but you can put cream. So that kind of stuff. And they, they seem to get it to try and, uh, to try and up calories. The other, imp the other important reason for doing this is once the kid is doing well, you can rapidly take the fat away. We don't want to go from FTT to obese, which can rapidly happen. Um, the kids with feeding disorders, you have to work with a good speech and language pathologist. Your number one job is to identify uh, speech and language pathologists who know what they're doing. If we don't have data in PEDS GI about a lot of nutrition conditions, there's even less data on what should be done with, uh, with feeding. There's, there's no data at all. A lot of this is empiric, so you need to work with people who know what they're doing. Um, and uh, if there is a significant feeding disorder, you might need, to, might need to put in a gastrostomy tube as well. When do I use Pediasure or its, or its cousins in moderate to severe failure to thrive, especially in unmotivated families, because there's a risk of the child worsening if something is not done? Remember not to give uh, the kid 100% of his or her calorie requirements in Pediasure because they will consume it, they will gain weight, but that's not what you want. So you want to achieve a balance between uh, Pediasure and solid food. Again, I'm using Pediasure, but it's just, it's just a 30 calorie per ounce beverage, and wean off this 30 calorie per ounce beverage at the first possible opportunity. If there is loss of calories, I don't need to tell you, you're going to look for malabsorption, you're going to look for the other reasons of vomiting and diarrhea. 
increase calorie needs, the main thing is concentrate whatever you can do. So maximally concentrate all solids and liquids and consider tube feeding early. Simple dietary advice may be all that is needed, but only rarely. You need to try and motivate families to try and do what they want. And sometimes it's just like getting an overweight child to lose weight. It's, it's a no-win situation. You're not going to win that battle. And you have to decide when to call it off. But these are the things that tend to work, nutritional advice, behavioral modification, and so social work intervention. Uh, I did not put ciproheptidine in my talk, but I do use it. The data, the data are mostly from the 1950s, but uh, it seems to work. And one of the things I've found is when you, when you get a grazer to be on Q3 hour meals and then you make them hungry by using ciproheptidine, it convinces the parents that these kids are eating better when they're on a, when they're on a regimented routine. And so sometimes they follow it. This is anecdotal and I, I don't have uh, clear data though. Hospitalization may be necessary only when nothing else works, and typically it is to show that the child is not being fed at home. Uh, it is also only of use in children under the age of two or three, because if you, if you admit a seven-year-old to the hospital, you, you're going to take a month before you can show weight gain. So it's not, it's not really that useful. The other thing I've found is people bring them in and immediately start them on something that they weren't on at home. That's not really helpful. So the first day or two, you have to continue with whatever they were on at home to try and see if that really worked or not. And then change feeds or do whatever else you need to do if needed. Follow up, um, more frequent follow up with very young children or with significant FTT. There's a variety of modes of follow up. You get a weight check versus a pediatrician visit, versus just seeing your dietitian, versus coming back to you, and you need to individualize this based on the child. So what about my uh, theory of kids you know, going to get, on, get a Nobel Prize? It, it doesn't really pan out. There are data showing that if you have FTT that's not treated, you will be smaller than kids who had FTT and were treated. Uh, if you look at meta-analysis, one showed that there was a three-point reduction in IQ at the age of three years. One might say that uh, a one standard deviation for that test is probably less than three points. But if you think of the decrement of a maternal cocaine exposure, the decrement in IQ is about two and a half points. And the increment from being breastfed is again about 2.6 or 3.4 points over not being breastfed. So we need to put all this into the, into the hat and figure out what really makes sense. I really don't know if this affects you or not. Uh, FTT may or may not be associated with adverse intellectual outcomes is, is the best I can tell you. Uh, the diagnosis of FTT is based on a careful history. Anthropometric measurements are important cut out juice and grazing, and work with a multidisciplinary team. So we'll go on to questions. <laughs> 15 month old, FTT, breastfed through 13 months, then transitioned to whole milk, started polyvisol as an infant, still takes one cc daily. Weight length and weight for length are now below the third percentile for age. Never seems hungry, loves sippy cup with whole milk, never puts it down, drinks 32 ounces of whole milk daily, grazes on crackers, pretzels, and other finger foods throughout the day, takes only bites at mealtime. Initial plan should include all of the following except. I, I like the except question because if I'm pimping people, I might as well do it properly. I think we'll call 16 as a quorum. So um, 
the, yeah, this is, this is the kind of kid that I would not offer eight ounces of Pediasure three times a day to. Eight ounces of Pediasure three times a day is about 720 calories. And this kid's not going to eat at all. You want to do all the rest of the things before you consider uh, using a high calorie beverage. So that is the correct answer. Um, Eight-year-old male, born at 32 weeks gestation, birth weight 1.3 kilos, otherwise healthy, no dietary concerns, poor growth, nothing else. What should you do? I think it's really late in the afternoon, so we're getting a lot of wrong answers. But I, <laughs> I, I can't stress this enough. You really have to make sure that this kid was born appropriate for gestational age. And if he, was, if he or she, I can't remember, was small for gestational age, then it may be a non-issue. So this is, this is really, really important. I also noticed that the first person who, who comes on is always right. Somebody with a really fast finger is also good. Okay, I didn't really talk about this, but you've heard about this. 15-month-old male with mild asthma, developmentally normal, takes cow's milk and liquids without difficulty, but refuses solid foods, no weight gain for three months. Okay, I actually like the answers here now. Um, the one, one of the things, again, that I didn't talk about is if a kid is drinking so much, you need to cut it down and see if the kid will take solids. So uh, this is also true. <laughs> th this is also true uh, if a kid is grazing all the time. You, you want to see if they'll eat, if you can make them hungry. So it's, it's starvation in, in inverted quotes. Uh, the, the kids that need a behavioral psychologist and a feeding team are the kids that, despite being starved, will not eat. There are kids who are autistic or have other developmental issues that will not eat even if you don't feed them for two days. And I'm not advocating not feeding a kid for two days. Um, so this, this is not the kind of kid that I would get, uh, I would rule out celiac disease in. Because what about celiac disease causes you not to eat or drink? Uh, I mean, uh, not eat solid foods. The reason to get a complete blood count here is this kid may have EOE, and you want to see if the kid has peripheral <coughs> eosinophilia. It's not a slam dunk either way, but it might help you. So the correct answer here is the, is the TTG, IgA, and, and serum IgA level. And that's it. Thank you. I, I also have a little plug for a talk that I'm doing at Naspigan, but that's for the expert. So I, I presume you're all now F experts since you've heard all the basics of FTT, and I'd like you to be at the talk if you're going to be at the, in Salt Lake City. Yes. It's a very good talk. Thank you very much. Um, when, you calc when you're doing uh, calculations to get catch-up growth, do you calculate them? So we're assuming a child now is a uh, failure to thrive. Do you do the calculations and requirements based on their ideal weight for age, or do you base it on their current weight, which is low? Number one is most of the kids that you're going to see 
are kids who are developmentally normal or have mild feeding issues, right? You, you don't really need to go ahead and calculate how many more calories you're going to give them because all of the things I told you are trying to improve their regular day-to-day -day routine. So all you're trying to do is give them a few more calories to see if they will grow. When, when those kinds of requirements become important is when you decide to feed them in one way, shape, or form, which is put in a tube of some sort, okay? And uh, all of us have various fudge factors that we use. One of the things that I will typically use is uh, use some estimation of uh, you know one of those EER equations and then add another 10 or 20 percent to it and see if the kid will grow. That's what I will do. Okay. Thank you for a great talk. Um, what is your advice, uh, uh, Gestalt, when do you send patients to endocrine for a suspected benefit for growth hormone therapy? What is your rule of thumb? Um, I I have an issue with growth hormone therapy because it's so expensive, and uh, I, I really don't know. I leave it to the parent. I tell them that this may be an option in the future. Uh, I really don't know when the $10,000 or $25,000 a year for X number of years for so many inches of height is really worthwhile, and I don't want to be making that calculation. So even if I send them to the endocrinologist, who knows what the endocrinologist is going to do. So. Just asking, if you were to do so, what would be your parameters even to think about it? I think really, really short children. Uh, and I don't know what really, really short is, but that's, that's what it is based on their mid-parental height. You know, if, you, if you're going to have a, a male who is going to be five feet tall, I don't know, maybe that's reasonable. If you have a female who's going to be four, eight, maybe that's reasonable. I don't know. Thank you. Um, I think the hypocaloric component is, is always there, but we still have to keep a close eye at something else. I've, I've diagnosed uh, um, Schwachmann diamond in an infant who was referred as hypocaloric failure to thrive, and, a teen, and there was a teenage girl who was diagnosed to have anorexia nervosa, and actually she had pathognomonic, pathognomonic features of celiac. So um, it's really not as, as simple as it is all the time. Uh, n no, that, that's, that's, the, that's the crux of the problem. 95% or more of your kids will have nothing wrong with them. So you have to keep your feelers open for those other two, three, five percent And uh, one of the things about pancreatic insufficiency is if they are otherwise well, they usually have voracious appetites, and that sometimes helps. I do deviate from this when I get a history that is not suggestive of hypocaloric failure to thrive. I'm not saying that everybody has hypocaloric failure to thrive. The, there's also another way of doing this. When they come in, if they're drinking some juice or whatever, you get rid of all of it, you bring them back, and if they're still not growing, then you pursue other things. So that, that's, the way, that's the way to do this. 